This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Starting with John chapter 5, I'm going to read the passage of Scripture, and then I'll give you a real quick review of what we talked about last Sunday, and then we'll follow up with the other two main points that I wanted to make. So in John chapter 5, um, this is the, the story of the man who was at the pool of Bethesda, starting with verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, we don't know what feast this was. We're not really told. We assume it was it was Passover, but we don't know if that's right or not. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been in an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool. When the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It's the Sabbath, and it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered him, My father is working until now, and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, we started this lesson last week entitled, Breaking the Rules. Jesus approached life and his ministry, um, and it seemed to intentionally fly in the face of traditions and rules. That was just the way that he lived his, his life. It wasn't that he was out to break the rules, but rather... He saw the rules as um, limiting and oppressive uh, to those who were seeking after God. When you try to connect with God through rules, it fails. You're not going to accomplish it. It just doesn't work that way. And I'm not talking about the law of the land now. Jesus followed the law of the land. As a matter of fact, as I pointed out last Sunday, when, when Jesus was finally arrested right before the crucifixion, it was Pilate who said, done nothing wrong. I don't find any fault with him. He, was, he didn't break the law, but he did break the rules and the traditions, the rules that the people set up for themselves. Now, what I'm talking about are the rules and traditions that we put on ourselves to define our own personal worth and value. Uh, and we do this different ways. And Christians and religious people are notorious for putting rules. Well, you have to act this way, and you have to be this, and you have to dress this way, and you have to you have to say thee and thou, and you can only read the King James Bible, and you can't read another Bible. And you know, and we put all these rules and regulations, they're fair say. And they're and, and we defend them to the hilt. I mean, you want to get a good fight started among among Christians. And just start bringing up some of those things, like uh, which is the correct form of baptism, submersion or sprinkling? Oh, there's blood on the carpet before it's over. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and you, you start talking about uh, uh, church membership. Is church membership really, I mean, is, is it biblical? Is it really necessary? There's blood on the carpet before it's over with. We have our traditions and our things. I'm not saying that they're all wrong. I'm not saying that rules and traditions are wrong. But when you live by those, when those set the standard and you say, this is how we're going to do things, because this is the rule, this is the tradition, then you have limited yourself. And Jesus said, look, it's bigger than all of that. It's far greater than all of that. And the obvious things that we're talking about are, for example, here in this, this example, where the pool of Bethesda, there was this tradition that if you were there, if you were an invalid, and the, the angel would come and stir the waters, and uh, we don't really know how that how the water stirred. By the way, there's nothing in the Bible that says this was valid or that it, it really happened. This was just their tradition. There's nothing in history that says that this actually worked. But uh, they believed that if they could be the first in the water when, uh, when the waters were stirred by the angel, whatever that meant, we think if the water there in that, in that particular uh, 
part of the pool of Bethesda uh, was uh, spring fed. And we think that whenever the, it wasn't, was that me chirping? I'm sorry. Uh, whenever um, whenever that the, the spring would release some water into the pool, it would bubble. And so they assumed that that was the angel spring water. And so the, the idea was that if you were the, one of the first few in, or maybe even the first one in, that uh, you would be healed. Well, can you imagine what a free-for-all that was? <laughs> I've always wanted to see a picture of that. Uh, and no, nobody got a picture of it, you know, the, the whole time. And I'm really irritated with, with all of those news people there because somebody should have gotten a picture of that, you know. And, and you know, it's it's like the waters are stirred. Throw me in, throw me in. And I'm thinking, dude, you're invalid. What if you drown? You know what I mean? I know there's no word about how many people drown trying to get into this pool during this time. But that was their tradition, and they really believed it. They really held on to it. It was a big deal. It was serious to them. Now, we laugh about that, but you think about this. Some of your rules and traditions people are laughing at because they know they're silly. Some of the things that you do. I mean, I, 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 I've got to tell you, here's a rule and tradition. I grew up in a home where, this is what my mother would say, a dancing ankle is never connected to a praying knee. We were not allowed to dance. My nephew just got married just a few weeks ago. Marsha went to uh, the, the wedding. It was in Illinois. And my mother was there. Guess who danced? <laughs> it was such a traumatic experience that my nephew stood there with his mouth open. Grandma is dancing? <laughs> Hell has frozen over. <laughs> so what happened to this tradition? What happened to this rule? Apparently, as you get older, it's like, ah, whatever. <laughs> so we have these rules and regulations that we abide by that really, we look at them and go, why, why are you, what's, what's, does that make you better? We weren't allowed to have comic books either. I had some. <laughs> but we weren't allowed to have them. But um, it was, it, you know, because, you know, they're just, they're sinful, they're evil, you know. There was all of these rules and regulations, and, and Jesus said, when you start putting rules and regulations on your life, all you do is limit it. You just limit life. You don't really understand the fullness and the beauty of everything that, is, that God has for you when you start trying to compress life into being something that you want to control. We do that to ourselves personally also, and I gave the example of, of teenagers who put these rules like, a, like especially here's a common one with teenage girls, like I, I'm afraid that if, if, if I gain a pound, you know, people won't like me. I, you know, I, I, I'm going to tell you girls something. It doesn't matter if you're a teenage girl or a teenage boy. You know, if people aren't going to like you, it isn't because you gain a pound, it's because you're obnoxious. <laughs> and so, um, has nothing to do with looks. And so, um, but we put these rules and regulations on our lives. They say, I've got to behave this way. I've got to be this, this, and I've got to do these certain things. And we begin limiting ourselves. Rules and uh, traditions begin to, uh, well, they run the risk of interfering with what God really wants to do. And rules and traditions don't get you in touch with God. They don't solve your problems. And they often limit life. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with them. I'm saying when they become this, the way that you live, the, the way you abide by those rules and traditions every day, then you limit yourself. Don't be so caught up in those rules and regulations that you miss out on the beauty and the fullness of life. I mean, it was Jesus who broke rules and traditions who also said in John 10, 10, I came that they, or you, might have life abundant. So here's one who broke rules and traditions but said, I want you to have abundant life. I want you to get the most out of life. So have you imposed rules and regulations on your life that interfere with the abundant life that God has planned for you? And there are three things that, that in this story that I want you to see about Jesus' ministry that we need to apply to our own ministry. Things that we need to do that free us from those rules and those traditions. Things that will set us above those that, that oppression and set us free to accomplish what it is that God wants to accomplish in and through us. And the first one is coming around healing other people, but Jesus did. 
and he healed this man at the pool of Bethesda. The second radical thing that Jesus did at that pool was that he broke the rules and traditions. Notice what the end of verse 9 says in, 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 uh, in John chapter 5 there. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And it went to the man who was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. <gasps> he did this on the Sabbath? You see, that violated rules and traditions. There was no law that said you couldn't do it on, on the Sabbath. These were religious rules and traditions. None of the religious leaders, uh, and they enforced this, none of them would ever do any kind of work on the Sabbath. You see, this invalid man was waiting at the pool at the right, for the right moment and waiting for the right thing to happen just so that everything would happen. Just That was his rule. And that was his tradition. I've got to be here. I'm, this is where it is that I'm going to find my healing. I've got to be here now. This is the place where I'm going to find my healing. That was his rule and tradition. Even though it was on the Sabbath, he was there. He was there because he was seeking his healing. Jesus bypassed all of those rules and traditions. I mean, the man never even got tossed in the water. And Jesus healed him. Jesus healed him. He bypassed all those rules and traditions. Now, what happened was that when the man got healed and Jesus said, the way he healed him, he said, take up your bed and walk. The man picked up his bed and walked. That violated a rule and tradition that was based on Exodus 20, verse 8, that says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And to those religious leaders, the idea of the Sabbath keeping it holy meant that you don't do any work. And carrying your bed on Sabbath was work. Even if it was just a roll-up pallet. It meant that you, you were doing something that was, that was work. You were, and if you walked more than so many steps, I don't remember how many steps it was, but if you walked more than so many steps, that was considered work. I mean, they had all these rules and regulations. And Jesus says, pick up your bed and walk. Two things he wasn't supposed to do on the Sabbath. And he picks up his bed and walks. And then uh, uh, Jesus heals on the Sabbath, which is something he wasn't supposed to do. And the religious leaders just about wet themselves. They, I don't know if you can say that in church, but anyway, they got upset and they just, they had a hissy fit that he would do something like this on the Sabbath. You just don't do that on the Sabbath. You don't, those were their rules and traditions. Now, they completely missed the prophetic truth about the Messiah, which was revealed in Isaiah. Imagine if they had thought about what Isaiah had said in Isaiah chapter 35, beginning with verse 2. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God, strengthen the weak hands, and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Now, if they had thought of that passage instead of Exodus 28 that says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, they would have come to grips with an absolute fabulous revelation from God. They would have broken their rules and regulations and their traditions. It would have, it would have, they would have seen, oh, that's so much bigger and better than this rule of we can't do anything on the Sabbath. They missed the point of the whole Messiah's being there, that he had revealed himself, and that he was accomplishing what the Bible said he was going to do, and he was revealing who he was. They missed it because of their rules and regulations and their traditions. Now, your ministry is to be like Jesus' ministry, radical. It is to be radical. It's not about the rules and traditions. It's about what God wants to do in and through your life. And every one of us is going to be different. Every one of us is going to have different rule, or different opportunities and different ministries. Every one of us is going to have different divine appointments in our lives. Every one of us. I had the most, uh, you know, I, I had such a cool experience this week. Uh, there is another voice talent uh, that I met actually a few months ago who lives out in L.A. And uh, I, I met her, and, and she speaks, she's bilingual, very good bilingual voice talent. Her name is Roxanne. And uh, I met Roxanne at, uh, at a conference that we were at. And because we were in the same business, and because we're both bilingual, we've kind of kept in touch with Facebook, you know, that sort of thing. And there's a, a little forum area where, where voice talents hang out. And uh, we were talking uh, this week, 
And she said, by the way, I thought you should know, when I was young and I was growing up, uh, I participated in Bible studies in Brazil that the Southern Baptist Church has pro provided. She said, I grew up with that. And I said, oh, really? And I came to find out that she knows the Lord. She has a relationship with the Lord. And I thought, how cool is that? Now, who else would have had that connection, you know, and that, that, that ability to encourage each other in a business where, where there are several Christians, but it's a small business. What I do is, is a fairly small business. And uh, uh, what a neat opportunity how God worked that out. Well, you're in the same boat. You have these, you have this, these circles of influence that some of them you don't even know about. People that you're going to connect with that you don't even know that you're really connecting with, and then it, it comes out to, to to revelation later on. You find out, wow, we had something in common. We shared something. And God had an influence in our lives, and there was something that we could share that uh, that that encourages each other. That's your circle of influence. Now, every one of us has a different circle of influence. Every one of us has a different ministry. Every one of us has different opportunities. Every one of us has different destinies. So it's not about the rules and traditions. It's about what God wants to do. It's not about having to follow the norms and the protocol. It's about what God wants to do. It's not about what will other people think or what will I think. It's about what God wants to do. You've heard me talking about the difference, and I mentioned this last Sunday, about probability and possibility thinking. The probability thinking was that this guy, this invalid, would stay at the pool of Bethesda for the rest of his life and never get into the water. Probable, it would, probably it would have never happened. The possibility is that God had plans for his life and was going to intervene in his life and violate the rules and traditions. You see, thousands of years ago, God already knew what he was going to do in this man's life when he was 38 years old. He already knew. There was no surprise to God. Jesus wasn't just kind of walking along one day and said, Hey, there's a dude. I'm not really doing anything right now. Maybe I'll just heal him. I don't know. It was by design. I mean, years, millions of years before, God had already planned that out. He knew what he was going to do. When Jesus showed up at the pool of Bethesda that day, he was just putting into motion what God had planned all along. So what is God getting ready to show you and do in your life that he planned millions of years ago? What is he getting ready to do in spite of the circumstances of your life? Because trust me, this guy had rotten circumstances in his life. I mean, when you're an invalid and you're just sitting on this filthy old floor by a pool every day, every day for 30, you know, how many, however many years he had been there, um, your circumstances aren't that good. No matter how rotten your circumstances are, God's still in control. You know, think about Gene. Gene's husband, Bill, passed away on Monday after a long battle with cancer. Rotten circumstances. Terrible circumstances. But you know what? I saw, I saw in, in the past several months, um, and I don't even know how long you, uh, you guys have been coming here to the Bible study, but it was so refreshing to watch Bill just take in the word and he would send me emails about things that I would say and, and uh, comment on them and to watch him grow in the Lord, you know, in spite of the circumstances of his life. And now Jean's going through a whole different set of circumstances in her life. But her circumstances don't define her. Her ministry defines her. You know, God's up to something in her life now. He's accomplishing something in her life that he wants to accomplish now in and through her life that he will not accomplish in anybody else's life in this room. What is he up to? What is he going to do? What does he want to accomplish in and through your life, regardless of the circumstances of your life? What is God getting ready to show and do in your life that he planned millions of years ago? Knowing that he did plan something millions of years ago gives you the freedom to live radically. The second ministry point, and that is that one of the things that, one of, one of Jesus' ministry styles and something that we have to plan in our life is that make sure that your ministry is relevant. Your ministry is to be relevant. Now look at this story. I'm starting with verse 10. So the Jews said to the man, pick up my bed and walk. And they said, well, who was it? And he said, I don't know. Because Jesus had slipped out. And then Jesus finds him in the temple and he says, you're well. Said no more, so that it, so that 
nothing worse may happen to you. What he was saying was, make sure you have a ministry now. Accomplish your ministry. Go out and do your ministry. Yours, that part of your life is over with. This part, that part is, is past. Now you have a, a ministry. You have something to accomplish. Go accomplish it. And if, because if you don't, things could even be worse. Your failure could even be worse. So go do what it is that God has to do for your life. Put the past behind you and move on. That's what he was saying to him. Go on. Put it behind you. Move on. You have something to accomplish now. And then the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. Now, a ministry of relevance, and this is so important to understand, relevance, the ministry of relevance is about meeting needs. Not wants, needs. And it's not defined by rules and traditions. Jesus met this man's need, even though it was on the Sabbath. That, wasn't, that didn't matter because that was a rule and tradition. It wasn't about the rule, oh, we can't do it that way. That, wouldn't that violate the rules and traditions? So what? What is God going to do? What is God up to? What is he telling you to do? How does he want you to do it? It's important to point out that Jesus sought to meet needs because it was through the needs that people discovered who he is. Listen to what I'm saying. By meeting their needs, they discovered who he is. The only difference today is that his ministry is accomplished through us. But it's still the same thing. God's in the business of meeting needs so that people can discover who he is. Only he uses us to do it now. Our ministry is to meet needs and introduce people to Christ. That's what we're up to. It's a lifestyle. It's a way of living life on a day-by-day -day basis where we just touch people's lives. And through the way that we connect with them, they come to know Christ. I want you to see something significant here. Notice in verse 13 that Jesus had slipped away from the crowd. Why? Oh, and, and how? Also important. Well, the crowd, meaning the majority of the people, were more interested or was more interested in seeing the miracle rather than the miracle worker. They were all geeked about the miracle that this invalid had been healed. That's what they were excited about. They were more interested in the miracle than they were in the miracle worker. They were so taken with this remarkable event that they missed the truth and the relevance of it. Their personal rules basically said that the abnormal, the unusual, the unexplainable is worth pursuing and following. We want to see something really, really incredible, something amazing, something, something that just grabs us at our, our fantasy. And so they chase after the miraculous and they miss the, the miracle worker. That happens today all the time, especially within people who can call themselves Christians. They start chasing after the miraculous and miss the miracle worker. A miracle is evidence of God's presence and power, no doubt about it. But chasing miracles is evidence of unbelief. Did you know that? The miracle is evidence of God's presence and power. But chasing after miracles, trying to find miracles and go and see miracles work, and I want to go see somebody do a miracle, and I want to see a miracle happen and all of that, is actually, and the Pharisees were notorious for this, um, is unbelief because the focus is on the wrong thing. Their focus is, is on just as it was with this crowd around Jesus, their focus is on the miracle rather than the miracle worker. So there's no belief there. They're just entertained. It's not that I want to believe in the miracle. It's just I want to see the miracle. And that's what happens with so many people in the world today. They want to see something spectacular, but they don't want to believe it. But they don't want to believe in it. They just want to see it and say, what if? You know, that's why there are so many, when you, you find these, and it, it happens in, in a lot of, of different religions, but uh, um, there will be some, some place that says, oh, there's been a miracle in this particular town, and people will flock to the town because all of a sudden there's a miracle. They just want to see the miracle. They don't, you know, they just want to be, they want to they have their, their senses uh, challenged. 
They want to see something unusual. They want to see something strange. They just want to see a miracle. Jesus warned about that mentality. He said in Mark chapter 13, starting with verse 22, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect, the Christians. Be on guard, I have told you about these things beforehand. What he's saying is, look, it's going to happen. There are going to be people who do the miracles, who do the, the fascinating things, just to get your attention, to draw you away, so that you're more fascinated by the miracle than you are by the miracle worker. Rules and traditions that seek after sensory gratification are out of bounds scripturally. You won't find Jesus endorsing that anywhere. Rules and traditions say that rules and traditions are what is relevant. Our rules and our, our traditions, that's what's important. We want to see something, something amazing because that's what's spiritual. We want to feel. Here's another one. Here's a, here's a dangerous one. I felt like the Holy Spirit was there. Sensory gratification. I want to feel something. I want to see something. It's, it's, it's a desire to connect with something unusual and to, and to have this sense of uh, even sensory overload that something unbelievable has happened. And instead of believing in it, we're just literally entertained by it. But God says that meeting people's needs is far more important. You see, Jesus was about touching this man's life and changing his life, meeting his needs. It wasn't about doing a show and getting people to see him perform the miracle. In fact, he had done the miracle and slipped away. They didn't even know. Nobody even knew who it was who did it. Even the, even the guy himself. He had slipped away. Why? Because it wasn't about the show. It was about meeting somebody's need. When we take on a ministry of relevance, ministry to people at the point of their need, here's what happens. We empower them to take on a ministry of relevance. Now listen to what I'm saying. It sounds like godly, but it's, it's true. When we, in, when we minister to people at the point of their need, we empower them to take on a ministry of relevance. Notice who became the minister here. This is what's so amazing to me. Jesus goes and he meets this guy's needs. Who became the minister? Was it Jesus? They didn't know who did it. This man became the minister, the witness, the evangelist, the, the ambassador. He was the one whose life was changed. And he, it, then he took on a ministry of relevance. The Jewish leaders didn't confront Jesus. They confronted this man. And his response was simply, hey, all I know is what happened to me. And I know that I will never be the same. How are you going to argue with that? And as God continued to work in him, he went back to the Jewish leaders and confronted them with more truth. By the way, he didn't have to go back. The verse says that he went back to, it, didn't, it wasn't that he was going back to tattletale on Jesus. That kind of reads that way, but that's not what was happening. He didn't have to go back. He wanted to go back. God had done this amazing thing in his life, and he wanted everyone to know it. And he had the goods to back it up. He became a minister of relevance. It didn't matter that it was on the Sabbath. That wasn't the point. The point was that his life had been changed. And because his life had been changed, <coughs> regardless of the circumstances of his life, he wanted to connect. He wanted to tell people about it. It was relevant. This, this example teaches us how God empowers us to minister. He meets our needs. Now listen to what I'm saying because this can be life transforming for some of you. What kind of minister can you be if God hasn't done a work in your life? If you've never had a need met in your life, if he hasn't met your needs, then what's the point? What's the point of having a relationship with him? What's the point of coming to church? If he hasn't
hasn't met your needs, what's the point? This is so important to understand. This guy had been hanging out at this pool of Bethesda for 30 years. He's 38 years old. I don't know how long he'd been hanging around the pool of Bethesda. Every day, every day, every day. And his needs had never been met. What's the point? Why did he keep doing it? Rules and traditions. What was the point? What was the point? Hope? Empty hope? Blind hope? What's the point? If you call yourself a Christian, and you, and you want people to believe that, that God can change their life and make their lives better, but He's never met your need, then what's the point? You're no better than the man at the pool of Bethesda. Just hanging around, waiting for something to happen. You're going through rules and traditions. You're playing games with the Word. You're playing games with your faith. You're wanting something to happen, but you're, it hasn't happened yet, if that's the case. But if He has met your need, then what, what does that mean? If he has been meeting needs in your life, and there are still needs that need to be met, of course, no question about that, but if he has met some needs in your life, then what does that mean? Listen to this. The very premise of God's relationship with you is the very premise of his healing that man at the pool of Bethesda. He met his needs so that he could minister through. You see that? He met that man's needs at the pool of Bethesda so that he could minister through him. When that man had his needs met, he became a minister of relevance. <coughs> he focused on what God had done in his life. <coughs> Jesus then finds him in the temple. John 5, verse 14 and 15 says, and he says to them, I love this by the way, I want you to notice the words. Jesus goes to him. He goes and he finds him in the temple. The guy didn't come looking for Jesus. Jesus went looking for him. He goes to him in the temple and he says to him, see, you're well. You're good and sin no more so that nothing worse may happen to you. And the man went away and told the Jews he became a minister of relevance. Now, let me tell you, what God is seeking to do in your life so important. God is seeking a ministry of relevance through you because he has done a work in your life. And that will also help you to understand what your ministry is. Met needs become your bridge for ministry. Do you see that? The needs that have been met in your life become your bridge for ministry. Met needs open the doors for your ministry. Met needs become the foundation for your ministry. This guy's life was changed because God met his needs, but that also became the foundation for his ministry. Because of what God had done in his life, he was motivated, he was empowered, he was led to share that and to connect with people because he knew it was real, it was relevant. He wasn't sharing out of theory, he was sharing out of reality what God had done in his life. You need an experience. You need a, 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 a point where you can look back at your life and see where God has met needs in your life that motivates you and empowers you to become the minister with the foundation of that met need in your life. Everything that I do in my ministry, I've realized, is, has to be based on those areas where I know that God has met needs in my life. Going back all the way to that time when I was 18 years old, when I discovered that God had a purpose and a plan for my life. He met a need in my life. I was, a, I was a kid who had wandered around for 10 years with no purpose, no plan, no focus, realizing that I was a mistake. I was illegitimately born. I should not have even existed. I was an accident. I had no right to live. And discovering at that point, at that place, in that room, in that dorm room up at William Jewell College, that God had a purpose and a plan for my life, that, that he had designed me, and it wasn't based on the circumstances of my life, it was based on the calling of my life. That was where it all started. He met a need in my life, a need where I had relevance. 
had a purpose, had a plan. And then other needs, as God began to meet other needs in my life, he put, he put this godly woman in my life who has prayed for me and encouraged me and supported me and is a pain in the neck sometimes. But she is what God designed for me. What I take great delight in knowing is that I that God designed me for her. <laughs> and then and then he, and then over and over how he has met needs with even job issues and those things were where I have had to trust God and recognize that if it weren't for God's grace and mercy, I would have nothing in that arena. And I have to trust him. Focus and he becomes the motivation for my life. Your ministry is based on how God has met the needs of your life. That's what it is. Your ministry is on how God has met the needs of your life. You need to take a long, long look at your life and what has God been doing in your life. And this is so important. I want you to listen to what I'm saying because I'm saying it with total, absolute, uh, believe me when I'm saying this, overwhelming love. For you older folks, and I'm including myself in that group, for older folks who have had a longer life where they've seen God do things in their lives, do you realize how much greater responsibility you have to minister? You know, it's we don't retire from the faith. We have to take on greater responsibility for ministry because we have greater experiences, greater wealth of experiences where we've seen God intervene in our life over and over and over. That's why the Bible says that the older women should teach the younger women and that the older men should teach the younger men. It teaches us that we are to carry that on because we've had those experiences in our life. We trust those experiences. It's important for all of us to learn from those who have had more experiences than we've had how we can take those times and apply them in our lives. It's important to connect with those people. Let them mentor us, if it, if it were, to become what it is that God wants to do and how he wants to fulfill his destiny in our lives. Which brings us to the third point, And that is that your ministry is to be righteous. Oh boy, I love that word. Because nobody really knows what it means. And so, oh, I'm righteous. We used to say that, you know, I remember when, when, when we'd hang out, I mean, back in my hippie days, you know, I was like, dude, that was righteous. You know? I mean, you know what it meant, but you know, it's just cool to say. But your ministry is to be righteous. John 5, starting with verse 16. This is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, my father is working until now and I am working. Now, what is righteousness? Here's the definition. Righteousness is what you do because you are in the will of God. What you do because you are in the will of God. That's all righteousness means. That's it's just a big word that says things that you do what you do because you are in the will of God. It's, it's a lifestyle thing. It's, it's the things that you do because you are in God's will. Jesus made it very clear that he was just doing God's will. That's what he said. Now next week we're going to see this in more detail, but, I, but notice what Jesus said in response to the Pharisees when they challenged him. It's in, it's in verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son himself can do nothing on of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Now what Jesus was saying was, this is how I operate. But what he was also saying was, here's the model for how I want you to operate. I want you to live by accomplishing what you see God doing. In other words, whenever you see God getting in on, whenever you see God doing something, and uh, you're motivated to do that, get in on it. There's no better way to live your life than to just get in on what God is doing. I mean, when, when you know that God is up to something, get in on it. It's part of what God wants you to be, what He wants you to do. There's a price to pay for that. The world is intimidated by that kind of lifestyle. But let me paraphrase what Jesus said in verse 17 so that you can apply it in your life. This would make a great tattoo. And I'm not advocating tattoos. <laughs> but here it is. God's up to something. And so am I. Man, if you could live your life that
that way, your days will be radically, relevantly different. In fact, your days will be radically, relevantly righteous. God's up to something. So am I. The bottom line is that your Father God is at work. How do you suppose that He's going to accomplish what He's up to? How do you think God wants to accomplish what He's up to? He's going to accomplish it through the ones that He's designed to fulfill His purpose. That's how He's going to do it. He's not just going to bypass us. He's going to use us. We're the tools in His toolbox. He's not going to bypass us. He's going to use us to accomplish what it is that he wants to accomplish. For his entire adult life, a man sat crippled at the side of the pool of Bethesda, following the rules and traditions, waiting for a miracle. That miracle finally happened. And although it didn't happen the way that the man expected it to happen, when God moved, he broke all the rules and traditions, and that man was never the same again. That is your story. I sometimes wonder what, what was that man's day like? Just think about this. What was that man's day like? He most likely woke up that morning expecting another day of disappointment at the pool. His day ended in the temple, worshiping and praising. Think about that. His day started off waking up going, oh my God, some or other get to the pool of Bethesda hang around there. Maybe there'll still be some bubbling in the water and I know somebody's going to step in front of me and I'm not going to get in again but I need to go because what else am I going to do? And, you know, and that's what a way to start your, your, your day. How pathetic is that? And it ended up with him literally worshiping and praising God in the temple. And I want you to see something here. He was in the temple. Jesus went to him and found him in the temple. And you know why that's so amazing? Because the rules and traditions of the day would not have allowed him in the temple because he was an infant. He was an outcast. He started the morning off as an outcast. And he's healed. And what does he do? He goes to the temple to praise and worship God. In the temple where he had been forbidden to go because of the rules and traditions. And can you imagine what it must have felt like for him to walk into that temple for the first time? Knowing that he was walking into the presence of God. Somebody who had healed him. He didn't even know who it was, but apparently God had done something in his life. And he woke up that morning as an outcast. And he walked into the temple that evening as a child of God. This morning, woke up as a child of God. You didn't wake up as an outcast. You woke up as a child of God. Somebody that God has already worked in. Somebody that God has already met some needs in your life. Somebody that God already has empowered. Somebody that God already wants to use. The possibilities for your life are overwhelming. The things that God wants to do in your life are mind-boggling. You are not an outcast. You're a, you're a holy child of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit to touch people's lives, change the world. You could have been that person who touched that invalid man if God had so chosen and changed his life forever. Because what we do is do what Jesus did. That's what we're supposed to do. As God directs us, as He leads us, as He focuses in our life and through our life, as He makes a difference in people's lives. Today, you may have started your day by the pool, waiting and hoping and not expecting much. But I want you to know that you can end it in the presence of God, worshiping and praising Him no longer. suggest that you start seeing things the way Jesus saw them. My Father is up to something. And so am I.